Hello, my name is Stan Tennant, and I'm the Director of Research for the Miro Foundation, and I'm assuming that most of you already know that. Um, this is an update of some recent work. For the first time, I think we are able to show a pr provisional presentation of how the letters are related to hand gestures. And if you'll recall, that's very important for our thesis. Um, the basis of one of the most important ideas that we have is that the text of Genesis and perhaps other canonized portions of canonized texts, of sacred texts, record letter-by-letter -letter meditations. And if you recall, in the past, we were basing all of our letters on shadows of this shape, which we've identified as a flame initially. We also identified it, put that right down, as the model of a fruit, with this being the seed, this being the fruit tree, and this being the volume of the fruit, such as an apple, and thus fitting the description in the introduction to the Zohar of a fruit tree, which is here, yielding fruit whose seed is in itself. And this is a model, as I've said on, on the Matrix of Meaning for Sacred Alphabets tape, of naked recursion, a minimum geometric representation of the propensity of the universe to propagate itself, to recur, to re-embed itself, to put a new seed capable of growing into a tree with new fruit inside of every fruit on the tree. Continuous self-embedment. And as we know mathematically, self-embedment is a model for hyperdimensionality, and it's part of our thesis that hyperdimensional mathematical concepts relate to the space in which consciousness takes place. But there's a major problem with our thesis, as we've presented it over the years, and that is it's been difficult to understand how you could turn this form around in your mind's eye so as to display the letters of the alphabet in the order given in a sacred text. If you can't turn the model around to display the letters in order, then you can't do the meditation. And to do that means you have to be able to visualize this form and rotate it somehow in your mind. Well, <clears throat> to make our long story short and based on the material presented in a matrix of meaning for sacred alphabets, we've also identified the form as a model human hand. And here's a somewhat bigger one than we've had in the previous models. And as you can see, it's got a thumb, and there's a tip. And this represents the highest point of consciousness. This is where the star of seeds would be in a fruit. This is our mind. And out here, we've got four fingers. You could almost say they are four rivers feeding the tree of life. Let me get it upside down here so you can see it. The tree in the middle of Eden. If you look at it this way, you could actually see how the model, put the other one down, could represent, if I rotate it, makes it a disk plane. Maybe you can see it better this way if I rotate it. You would define a disk around the base here. And there'd be a star here and a crescent here. This is a reflector. This is a source. So you can identify this with the sun and this with the moon, if you'd like. This with inside and this with outside. This is the seed. This, again, is the fruit. And the whole model is a model human hand. There would be three hands together, or six in some other configurations, that would make the whole fruit. And it depends on how it's arranged. I'll show you that hand very directly. This is important. If you look at a model fruit, here is an apple. Now, if this were a real fruit, if you went down the stem, you would come into the middle, where there'd be a star of seeds in the middle. And the flower end would be here. And there'd be a hole. We could draw a deeper notch down the middle to go into the, into the seeds in the middle. Now, the reason we realized this was a hand is once we had driv drawn these lines, which represents, re represent the edges of a particular kind of knot, which we'll get into later in the tape if we have time or on a supplementary tape, what you realize is that this can be very much like a kind of bowling ball, where if you could put your thumb down into the middle, you could grasp between each of these edges, and it would look if I can display it for the camera, just like a hand. Remember, my thumb is going into the middle. And what I'm saying is that each of these regions, from here to here, would be a hand. And of course, there'd be three hands as I go around. I'll show it to you from here. There's three, three hand-shaped sections. And so there'd be four fingers in each one, the thumb in the middle. There'd be 12 fingers around the perimeter. 
and thus you have 12 tribes around the seed center, the star, the tabernacle, if you'd like. In, in, in other traditions, there are 12 apostles, there are 12 knights around the round table, there are 12 imams of Shia Islam, there are 12 houses to the zodiac. There are a whole number of 12 around one forms. And in the middle, of course, if we were to open it, this disc, I don't know if you can see this very well, but the disc is the flat earth. This is where, you know, I'll put it inside, maybe you can see the hand in there. You put the hand inside, this disc becomes the earth, there's the sun, this is the heavens, the dome. And what we've got in our model, again, is a model hand. Now, why a model hand? Well, now we're going to get back to the discussion. The hand, the human hand, is a form that is automatically possible to be visualized by human beings. Even a child, even a blind person, can see their own hand. If you close your eyes, you can try it right now with me on the camera, just close your eyes and point towards something, move your fingers any way you'd like, move your hand any way you'd like, you can see where your hand is pointing. There, I'm saying how. Well, I know that my fingers are up, and my thumb is pointing this way, well, etc. And when I open my eyes, I see it's correct. We each know our own hands. Now, since the letters are shadows of this model hand, as I tip my hand, I can immediately see the letters. And that's what we've found. Now, why should that be? Well, it makes sense because the hand is the means by which we project our conscious reality, our conscious wills, into the physical universe. We dispense our consciousness into physicality by means of the hand. The human hand is the human embodiment of a general projective principle. The Kabbalistic tradition, tradition teaches that the universe is created by the will of God, not the essence of God. We express our will in the physical world with our hands. Metaphorically, God expresses the creation of the universe, dispenses it into physicality as an unfurlment, as a projection of his will. And that's the model being presented. Now, I'll go into more of the details later, but I'd like to go through the letters. We've got to back up one more small step. And I'm not going to do this with the charts that I usually show. I'm going to try to do it all with my hands. If you remember the chart that we showed in the Matrix of Meaning for Sacred Alphabets, it was an enneagram. Three levels of enneagram, three levels of nine. Well, if my thumbs go to s together in the middle, then I've got nine points here. And we could go from Aleph to Beit to Gimel to Dalit to He to Vav to Zion to Chet to Tet, using the Hebrew names. And we could continue that Yud, Chof, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samech, Ayin, Pe, Tzadi, Kuf, Resh, Shin, Tav, Final, Kaf, Final, Mem, Final, Nun, Final, Fe, Final, Tzadi. And we get a logical matrix, if you remember that tape, where the Aleph, the Yud, and the Kuf, at three levels, the level of Keter, of archetypes, the letter of Hakma, internal wisdom, and the later level of Bina, external understanding, each three levels, Aleph, Yud, and Kuf, Aleph, Yud, and Kuf represent the seed, the beginning point. The Beit, the Kof, and the Resh, they represent breaking open. They represent the first distinction. The Gimel, the Lamed, and the Sheen, they represent action. The um, Gimel Dalit represents division, dispersion, dilution. I'll just go through the first rank to make it simple. You can look at the charts with the other tape. The He is connection. It's in the middle. It's a frame. The Vav is a pin. The Zion is a projective marker. Indicates projective action, growth. Zerah is a seed. Um, the Chet is to surround as a perimeter, as a fenced field. The tet means totality, wholeness. The tithe, the teat, the gratuitous addition after the child is born to bring to full maturity. And again, with the nine for each of the other two levels of the alphabet. And so we've assigned a logical meaning to each letter based on a logical matrix, which is based on the mathematics of the 27 lines that determine the surface of a hypersphere or of a torus. Again, that's on the other tape, and we'll get to it later. The important thing is that each of the letters that we, meanings that we've determined for the names of the letters 
is completely consistent with the traditional teaching about the name of the letter. When we say that the letter pay, for instance, means mouth, and that's what the Hebrew tradition says it means, we can look on our chart and we see that the letter pay on the chart means to swallow or to engulf a volume. That's the function of our mouth. It swallows or engulfs a volume, the letter pay. Um, when we say um, the letter samach, samach literally means to support. Well, if we look at our chart, we find that samach is related to the golden mean unfurlment principle, which is a fundamental support for this reality. It's an unfurlment principle. Um, we could go through the whole alphabet that way, and the charts are there, and you can see them. What I'm going to show you now is something most extraordinary and really interesting, I think, and that is the sequence of hand gestures that give you the letters of the alphabet in alphabetical order with each gesture, the natural meaning of the gesture being the meaning of the letter that enables you to see that letter. The gesture enables you to see the letter when you're looking at it. I'll go through that again. I think I uh, got a little confused in saying it, but we'll do it. And we're going to find that those gestures and those meanings are consistent with the chart and with the traditional meaning. And the motion I'm going to show you, and this is very important, this is not to be taken as a final determining path that I'm going to show you. There could definitely be changes and corrections, modifications and improvements. It should be a smooth, dynamic flow. Also, I'm only going to show you the letters in alphabetical order. Aleph to Beit to Gimel to Dalit to Hei to Vav, etc. If you're reading a text, you have to go between any letter and any other letter. And that's not the same as alphabetical order. That's why we believe in Sefer Yitzira, the book of formation, they give a multiplication table for all the letters. And they take the 22-letter alphabet, they skip the letters that connect to themselves, and they go Aleph times Beit, Aleph times Gimel, Aleph with Dalet, Aleph with He, Beit with Aleph, Beit with Gimel, Beit, etc. the whole multiplication table. You multiply it out, you get 231 possibilities, not counting reversals. We would have to master all of those 231 transitions before we could actually read the text. That's the next step. Let me get the path of unfurlment on the record for you so you can see it and start to play with it. I'm going to go through it relatively continuously, and then I'm going to go through it and tell you the names and the meanings of the letter and letters, and then maybe we'll focus in on the individual letters and talk about them a little bit also. Remember, these are provisional. I can see the letter that I'm telling you about in my right hand as a shadow of the model hand, if you were to look through my left hand into my eyes, you would see the same letter in my left hand. Now, we'll show that to the camera in a few examples later on. <coughs> Let's just do it. Okay, here are the hands in my hand. The left hand is an older model. This is the one we had on the matrix of meaning tape, and it's only a, a finger width model. The right hand is 60 degree increment. If it were fully a third of the circle, it would be 120 degrees. 60 degrees is a lot easier to make, and you can see all you need to see on it. As we try the other thicknesses, the other, the other widths of hands, we may learn some additional modifications to the system. The letters we're going to see are the Rashi Nachmanides letters, which are on the charts in the Meru material. Um, we're only going to do the 22-letter alphabet now. In the past, we've attempted to generate the 27 this way. I've come to believe that it's the 22-letter alphabet that's the key for this system now. And so we're going to go through the 22 letters and leave the finals for another time. The finals appear on the hypersphere in the idealized 27-letter set. This is the linear 22-letter set mapped onto the alphabet. Back down to the body. Sorry. Okay, here, let's do it. I can see now an olive, and I'm going to unfurl it and say the letter name as I do it. Now I'm looking down at my, towards my waist, and in my hand, I see the, the K shape, the Rashi Nachmanides olive. Now, if I do this motion, I get bait. Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Vav, Zion. Chet, Tet, Yud, Chof, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samech, Ayan, Pei, Tsari, Kuf, Resh, Shin, 
tav. Now I'm going to go through it again. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yud, Chof, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samech, Ayin, Pei, Tzadi, Kuf, Resh, Shin, Tav. And you'll notice I did it with my eyes closed. It's actually easier to do with, my, with your eyes closed. And once you've done it for a while, there's no need to even have the model. These are not to be taken as some sort of an idol that is a special thing. This is simply an aid to doing the exercise, which is itself nothing but an aid to doing the meditation. We're not attempting to put forward some sort of new pagan idol of the sacred hand or something. This is definitely not the idea here. <coughs> Let me do it again. And this time, I'll do it more slowly, and I'll tell you about each letter. And perhaps we'll be able to come in on some of them, because I'll do it slowly enough. The first letter, Aleph, maybe I can hold it up so the camera can see it. If I hold this square to the screen, now you can't look down from my eyes, so I'll have to hold it a special angle for you. But I think you'll find that if you just clip off the top here, that that looks like the K-shaped olive. And again, you'll find that in the Shadowgram book. I think you'll see the K. Well, that's what I'm seeing when I look down at my waist in my right hand. And Aleph is all, the whole thing. So I assume this is just pointing at the whole body somehow. Then Beit means to break open, to birth. And so I've got my knees bending, baruch. My knees are bent. And my hands are open as if I'm birthing. And if you were to look in my left hand, you would be able, if we hold it just so, and again, I'll have to tip it some for the camera. If I can do it. No, I'm, getting, I'm losing it here. Let's take the time to do it, though. I want to show you the Rashi Nachmanides date. And you should be able to see it there. If you look at the table, you'll see that that looks very much like the, the Rashi Nachmanides bait shape. OK. So we've got Aleph all, bait, birthing, breaking open, first distinction. Gimel is action. Gal is a cycle. So we want to flip things over in a kind of rotational cycle. And now I can see a gimbal in my right hand, and I think you'll be able to see fairly easily a gimbal in my left hand here. Here's our gimbal. Now I'm going to pull apart and face down. And I've got dalit, and dalit means to pour down. And I've got limp wrists here. And in my right hand, I see a dalit. Now, hey means to frame, is a doorway, is an opening, and I'm going to rotate, look through the side of my head, and I'm going to see the letter hey in my right hand outside here. Now, I can't really, if I turn my head, I'll see the hey, but I don't have to do that because of the way my eyes work, the way my hands work. I can see in my mind's eye through my head. Um, and there you can see on the camera the letter hey that I'd be seeing. Now, vav means a pin. And a connect, a string of vertebrae, a golden mean unfurlment. The vav is going to be this part of the hay, but right over my spine, behind my head. And literally, I can see this through the back of my head. I see the shape vav in my thumbs pointing down below my head. Now, Zion, the next letter, means to project. So I come over my head, and I make a projective motion. And if the camera will go to my left hand, you will see the Rashi Nachmanides Zion rather cl clearly done there. Just forget about my fingers. And just look under my thumb part. It's this part here. And I think you can, if I hold it just so, you'll see it. There it is. It's, it's this part here. And that's my Zion projecting forward. Zion, projectiveness off the matrix chart. That's the meaning, Zion is a grain to go on, to grow, to gain. Chet means to encircle or to surround. So I come down to my waist, I pull my arms out fairly wide, and I look down in my hand, and there's the chet. There is the limit of the fenced field. Now that's chet, then I come around to tet, 
tet is to hold the whole thing, the ball, the completeness. Then I come up to yud, which is hard to identify any other way. It could be almost any part of it. Then chaf in my palms, and here are my palms facing me. My palms. And lamed, lamed is wonderful. Lamed is a flame being reflected right back into my eyes. Lamed means two. Lamed means learning. And if I turn this so you can see it, you can see that here is the flame of consciousness. Here is the reflector. And it's being reflected directly into my eyes. So Lamed means into me. Now, Mem means from or source of. And I'm projecting from my throat. And I see a Mem right here, right in front of me. You should see it in this hand. And if I hold it just so, you will. There's the Mem. And I think most people who know the letter Mem will see the silver Mem right in front of them. Just clip off the side a little bit here. Yeah, there you go. It's hard to turn it against the camera. So here's my mem, which means from. And after all, we're talking about speech, so it's projected from the throat. Nun, if you look, means to connect the neck, the nexus. And I'm going to see a perfect nun when my hands are on both sides of my neck. The ne nun I see is this line here. And the nun you can see is very simple. It's this big. Well, let's get it square onto the camera. It's this big loop. This is the vertical part, and there's the horizontal part of the nun. And if you put it against your, your throat, you'll see it quite clear. You almost have to look through the back of your hand. Now, samek means to support or su to sustain. It looks a little like an upside down mem in the Rashi Nachmanides version. And when I make the cradling gesture, I see the samek in my right hand. And I'll show it to you in my left hand when I take my hand out of the way. But I'm seeing a samic cradling in my right hand now. And the camera should be able to see the samic if we line it up properly. Let me get this confusing one out of my hand. And the camera should see the samic. If I get there it is, right there. And if you look on your chart of Nash Rashi Nachmanides letters, you'll see the samic shape. So I've gone from Mem to Nun to Samak. Now, Ayin means eyes, sight line. And again, the Ayin is right here. Put my hands alongside my eyes like blinders on a horse. And in my right hand, I see the letter Ayin. And you can see quite clearly the letter Ayin in my left hand. I get to getting the angle right maybe a little tricky for the camera. Let's see if we can do that. I'm tipping it. Something like that gives you an iron shape. You can, most people who know the iron will see it there. There it is. Very good iron. Okay, right here. Pay means mouth. To swallow or to engulf. To puff. To gulp inward. I see the pay in my right hand when my hands point towards my mouth and allow this projective out of the mouth motion. And you should be able to see a pay over here. And I don't know if we can get that easily. It may, oh, it's going to be upside down and backwards because from this view, so you won't be able to do that easily. So you won't be able to see the pay too easily until we do it in the computer simulation. You'd have to sort of come down under and look up at it into my, into my mouth to see it. After pay, mouth, is tzadi, righteousness. The tzadi is apparent when you pull your hands up and tip them back like this. And I can see the tzadi wound around my thumb and my right hand. Now, I think this is sort of the clean hands gesture or something like that, where you're showing the backs of your hands are clean, you're holding them up. It's, it's a kind of purification holding form. And I think I can show you that tzadi. This is the Rashi Nakmadi tzadi right over here. And if you cut it off at about this point, you'll see it quite a quite nice version of one. Just look on your letter charts. OK. Kuf is a skull. If this is tzadi, I want to define my skull. It's up at the top of my body. And I'll go like this. And then I'll see a kuf in each of my hands. I mean, actually, I see it in my right hand. And you might see it in my left hand if we looked at it properly. There we go. Uh, you have to look at the table to do that. Okay. So I've got tzadi, kuf. Then Raish is to radiate from the forehead, the head to radiate. And so I see a Raish in my right hand. And you should see one right here in my left hand. In fact, there's the Raish. 
There's the rash, right up against my forehead. Sheen is to shine, so I'm going to use my hands to block the light of the sun or to radiate from my head. And I see a sheen in my right hand, the Rashi sheen. The angle is wrong for you, but if you were looking at it from into my eyes, you'd see the Rashi sheen in my left hand. And then if I come straight down, I get Tav. It's an upside down, backwards kind of olive, sort of a backwards olive, and it means points back to myself. Again, Tav on our chart means itself, selfness, self-reference. Now let me go through it again, and I'll say them another time. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yud, Chof, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samech, Ayan, Pei, Tsari, Kuf, Resh, Sheen, Tav. I'd like now to share with you a few additional um, ideas as to what this form has been identified with and show you a few other odds and ends about it that I didn't get to a little earlier. Um, it's a hand. We know that. A general projective principle. We talked about that at the beginning. Um, what we have is a flame of consciousness and a reflector. We have a sun, a star of seeds in the middle of a fruit, and a moon, a crescent surrounding it. We have, um, if you remember, <clears throat> there's a description of Torah on one foot. This is the one foot, and this is not a golden mean spiral, but it's a golden rule function, which is more fundamental than a golden mean spiral. And so that's Torah on one foot as it's come down to us. Rabbi Hillel is quoted as saying, when challenged, the emperor wants to know what Torah is. Tell me why, I'm, why you're standing on one foot. Um, Rabbi Hillel says, don't do to anyone else what you wouldn't want them to do to you. Go and study the rest as commentary. Um, and that's come to be known as Torah on one foot. This is a, an expression of that self-embedding principle. Don't do to anyone else what you wouldn't have them do to you is another statement of self-embeddedness. Um, you could take this to be related to Plato's allegory of the cave. Here is the cave part, here is the light, and the human plane is in here in between. And we see reflections on the cave wall from the light. Um, I mentioned Aladdin's lamp, obviously the flame and the reflector. An interesting aspect of this, which I haven't mentioned before, is that while it's a hand on one hand, it's a hand on one hand, notice my thumb is coming up where the stem would be if this were an apple. I've got half an apple here. The stem would be up on the top. If I grasp it in my left hand, and remember there is a stem coming out here, then it is the scabbard and hilt of a sword, which shows up in some of the mythology of some peoples that have made use of these models. Also you can see why you'd get scimitar forms because of the sculpting of this, and people could interpret it as a scimitar. If you look at some of the ancient Egyptian iconography, you'll find Horace hawk shapes and other bird shapes. And I think if you look around, look at this form from certain angles, you'll see how its outline is very hawk-like. This would be the beak. If you also look at some of the iconography of ancient Egypt, you find what the archaeologists call the double crown of Egypt on the pharaoh's head. It's a combination of upper and lower Egypt in a dual crown. If that upper and lower is just a slightly off translation, and upper is really inner and lower is really outer, then we have inner and outer, and we have a dual crown with a conical section in the middle and a round surround on the outside. Properly stylized in the Egyptian style, this would be the double crown of the pharaohs of Egypt. Why would it be on their heads? Why do we put turbans and headdresses, scepters on the top of poles? Why in the Eastern teachings is there a thousand petaled flower that blossoms in the mind, a golden flower? Because what you put on a priest's or a shaman's or a teacher's or a king's head is an attempt to express, to express the consciousness that's going on inside that head. 
And if the person on the hero's journey up Mount Olympus, up Mount Analog, up Mount Meru, from the plane of earthly existence up towards the transcendental peak in seven stages, identifies with the hero, then this process unfurls in their mind's eye, the same meditative process as the mythological hero's journey. It's not a myth mythology, it's the record of a meditation in narrative form, and this is the form. If we examine the descriptions of the Sufi poet Rumi, where he describes the Medlevi Sufi round dance, um, this is the cypress tree in the middle of the garden, and this is the round dance. And if you read the description carefully, you'll see it fits this form, a dynamic motion in the body. If you read in the daily prayers in the Hebrew tradition, you find something very interesting. There is a blessing that is said before saying the credo of Judaism, the Shema, Shema Yisrael. And the blessing says, he who illuminates the earth, I'm sorry, um, blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who forms light and creates darkness, who makes peace and creates all. And what the teaching in the prayer book is, is that when you say who creates darkness, you touch the head to fill in. And when you say who creates light, you touch the arm to fill in. Did I get that right? If I didn't, I better get it over again. Yes, uh, who creates, uh, you say or, touch the arm to fill in, uvone hoshek, touch the head to fill in. The darkness, the hoshek, is in the darkness in the dome of the mind in meditation, the quiet mind. And the light is the light of the world outside. And it also says in the Shema, the Credo, it says, now I'll read the Hebrew first, Ukshartam la'ot al yadecha v'hayu l'totafot b'nei necha. It says, bind them as a sign upon your arm and let them be tefillin between your eyes. When you bind the tefillin strap, on your arm, on your hand, and on your arm, seven turns. You see a sheen, you see a dalit, you see letters bound on your hand, and you place the upper tefillin on your forehead. That is a representation that you're supposed to be seeing the same letters in your mind. In fact, R.A. Kaplan, in the new Sefer Yitzhira book that's out, is very clear about that. He says on page 27, the only link between nonverbal wisdom, hachma, inside, and verbal understanding, outside, verbal projection, outside, consists of the letters of the alphabet. And that's what we found. So we believe, and I don't want to go into the details here, that the teachings in Judaism of binding the tefillin, the phylacteries on your hand and on your arm and on your heart and having it appear on your mind's eye is part of this same system of projecting and using the alphabet for fundamental meditations. I would suggest people um, study the Rashi Nachmanides letters. We are going to attempt to make these models available later this year. I know we've said that before, but this time we think we're going to do it. Um, and um, then you'll be able to practice them. And then we'll get some feedback and we'll find out what's right and what's not right and what works and what doesn't work. Now, um, you can leave the presentation now and just look at the, at the motions. Obviously, a, a person with better abilities to dance could present it better than I could. We think this is a kind of Tai Chi-like motion. It should be smooth. My motions haven't been as smooth as possible, and I know you can't really see them all that well, but it gives you some idea. The key finding is that the gestures, the natural meaning of the gesture, is consistent with the meaning of the letter and the sequence of gestures as you go through the alphabet are reasonably smooth so that this is an unfurling principle. It goes around the spine, which is interesting. There probably are other ways to see the letters behind the body. There may be alternative paths. This is worth examining. If we can learn the letters in order and how to go from one to the other, then it's possible that we can recover the meditations recorded in the texts. So um, we will continue to record some additional material now. If it seems suitable, we'll add it to this tape. If not, it'll be a supplement or it'll be later. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Um, this is work in progress. It's copyright to the Merrill Foundation, both the forms and the dance. And we'd like your feedback, your comments, your suggestions, your criticism. Obviously, 
there is much more that we could be saying. Thank you for your time. Uh, if you'd like additional information, um, please give us a call.